What's up guys? It seems that everyone is focused on these flagship devices like the HTC One M9 and the Galaxy S6. But what about budget phones? Not everyone can afford a $700 phone. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about a phone that costs just a tad over $150. So without further ado, let's get started. This is the B Pro made by Ulephone. If you've never heard of it, don't be surprised. The company is based out of China, and like many China-based companies, they're trying to make a name for themselves. On paper, the B Pro has pretty decent specs compared to what current flagship phones have. Actually, this phone a year ago today would probably still be considered a flagship device. So what do you get for $160? Well, you get a phone with a removable 2600 milliamp battery, two gigs of RAM, a 64-bit quad-core CPU running it at 1.5 gigahertz, 16 gigabytes of onboard storage, which is expandable to 32 gigs using a micro SD card. It has a dual SIM tray with standard and micro, and you also get LTE support too. All this is fitted into a body that sports a five and a half inch display running at 720p. Oh yeah, they also threw in a screen protector which was perfectly installed and you wouldn't even know it's there unless you saw the cutout at the very top of the phone. Now when you compare this phone to its biggest competitor, the Moto G, the second generation which goes for about $180, this is actually a better value. But is this phone really that good? I mean, let's face it, most of these off-name brands really look good on paper, but when you finally use them in the real world, well, they tell a different story. Let's start off with the build quality. The design of this phone looks really similar to the OnePlus One. In fact, they even sell a sandstone texture cover, which I think it's funny. If you put them side by side, you'll have to do a double take to make sure which one's which. The phone itself feels and looks great. I really have no complaints about it, and for a phone that costs under $200, I'm actually quite impressed. The button placements are in their ideal location and are easy to locate while using it. The back is smooth, but not slippery, and although it's made of plastic, it doesn't feel cheap like older Samsung devices. The back is also slightly curved, so it's comfortable to hold even for a five and a half inch phone, which for some, it's still too big. The speakers are located towards the bottom on the backside and are actually pretty loud. They're not the best sounding speakers in terms of quality, but they're not terrible either. The display has a resolution of 1280 by 720 and with Quad HD phones starting to be the norm, it seems so backwards to even consider such a low resolution. But in reality, you'd have to be about six and a half inches away from the phone to even notice any pixels. So I wouldn't really call this a deal breaker. Overall, the display looks good. The viewing angles are also good. The colors and saturation are actually pretty good. When watching movies or playing video games, the experience was enjoyable. Once again, for $160, it definitely exceeded my expectations. The main rear camera is a 13 megapixel shooter, which is also capable of capturing 1080p video. It has an f2.2 aperture to help in low light situations. But my experience with the camera was okay at best. Even in the best lighting conditions, the pictures were decent and at night, it wasn't that great. I even tried different camera apps to see if maybe it was the software, but the results were pretty much the same. The front facing camera is an eight megapixel and the results were pretty much identical to the rear. So if you're planning on going to a nice vacation or if you know you're gonna be taking a lot of pictures, I'd probably take a dedicated camera. Otherwise you might be disappointed. Okay guys, let's go ahead and move on to the software side because I think this is where it can make or break a phone. The B Pro is running Android KitKat 4.4.4 with an almost 100% stock Android or vanilla ROM. Similar to the Moto G or even the Moto X, it has minor tweaks to enhance the user experience, but not intrusive enough to be in your face. Most of these are turned off by default. For example, gesture sensing. You can wave your hand across the phone like a Jedi and initiate an action. I found these didn't work so great though. It also has screen gestures like double tap to wake. Again, these were a hit and miss, so I wouldn't really rely too much on them. I wanted to test the performance of the phone. I'm not a fan of benchmarks, but I wanted to get a baseline to see where this phone stacks up compared to the competition. In several benchmarks that I ran, it actually performed really good, beating out previous flagship phones like the Galaxy S4 
and it was almost on par in performance with the Nexus 5. But benchmarks are just, well, benchmarks. It doesn't really mean anything. What matters is how the phone responds to real world performance and how smooth the UI is. Overall, the phone is very fluid. Animations are smooth and fast. It handled every app I used just fine. I almost forgot I was using a budget phone and it felt like many current flagship phones today. In fact, for fun, I put my Nexus 6 and B Pro phones side by side to do an unscientific test just for fun to see how quickly apps would load. I performed an app test to see how quickly each phone would open and load the information. And after repeating this test several times, the performance is pretty much on par with current flagship phones, which is kind of interesting considering this is still running on the Delvic runtime. I think it's safe to say this thing is no slouch, though the real test was going to be in the gaming department. So I fired up several games, including some that are more demanding on the GPU, because it's only rendering at 1280 by 720 resolution. The GPU had no problem handling any game I threw at it. One thing I should mention is that this phone never once got hot. It was always cool to the touch, no matter how heavily I pushed it. That's something that you really can't say about current flagship phones. Most of these phones get really hot quickly, and that was something that I really enjoyed using this phone. Now this phone offers a lot of value for your money, and I can definitely vouch for that. But there's one thing I have not talked about yet, and that's software updates. This phone was supposed to already have Lollipop. Before it was even released, they said it would be available by over the air in February. We are now in April and nothing has happened. In fact, if you go to their website, all of their promo photos show Lollipop as the UI. But like many Chinese based companies, that promise for timely updates is easily forgotten. And Eulophone is following the same trends by luring people in with an attractive phone with good specs and forget all about software updates. This phone may never see another update again, and it's unfortunate because it's a pretty damn good phone. You're almost better off buying the Moto G for $20 more, or get a pre-owned Nexus 5 that has huge developer support and is still being supported by Google. So it's conclusion time, and I think that we've learned a few things, and one of them being that Android has come such a long way to the point where you can buy a budget Android phone and not sacrifice much compared to a phone that costs five times as much. On the flip side, does a phone that costs five times more offer five times better performance? And does it offer five times better build quality? Looking at some of these flagship phones today, I'd be tempted to say that we shouldn't have to settle. Like OnePlus said it, never settle. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you hit that like button and also reshare this with all of your friends and family. Until next time, adios.